Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, my name is Dave Ashton with the APN New Community Radio. Um, I have to sadly announce at this moment that um, our featured speaker for tonight's event, Julian Rubenstein, had a positive COVID test yesterday and is a little under the weather, but in no way were we going to cancel. In no way were we going to have a replacement date. We have gotten okay with using the Zoom stuff. We found the largest television in the entire building. We had the tape measure out. And um, so Julian will be joining us from home and um, showing his clips uh, from home. So we're just waiting for him to come on. And actually, he is here. So that's the good news. This is the introduction instead of the preamble. OK, Julian, awesome. Thanks. You are here. Um, OK, we're going to start things off with our uh, quick land acknowledgment. We have to understand that we are on the unceded territory of the Cheyenne Yu Arapaho tribes and many other peoples that have used this land for millennia. And a place called Denver is a new addition. So we're going to talk a lot about, uh, about Denver, about uh, urban development and the city. Um, first, to start things off, this is just a regular author talk. We have a poet to initiate this evening's proceedings. So from the Sacred Voices Poetry Group, I would like to introduce Cipriano Ortega. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. How are you all doing? Good. Excellent. You're enjoying that sexy pizza. <laughs> it's called. But yes, I want to thank you very much all for being here. Thank you so much for allowing me to express my poetry. It was an honor and a privilege to read uh, Julian's book and just know this incredible story that uh, was happening and that happened in Denver and on Holly Street. So it was an interesting thing. I've never been really commissioned to write poetry about a particular subject before, but um, the subjects presented in the book and the challenges that uh, Denver as a community faces, I feel I write a lot about that in my work and with my work with Sacred Voices. Uh, we're a local nonprofit that actually houses our open mics here every second Friday down in the media center that they're or the studios that they have down there as well, too. So feel free to check us out there if you have any questions afterwards. So without further ado, I'll kick this off with one of my poems. Get the microphone effect since I'm holding it by my hand. So what is called show business hard, but so is life. Show business hard, but so is life. A fish out of water always drowns. There are so many worlds in Denver I will never know. So many languages I'll never speak. They tell them to climb like Tarzan. The Druids consider the Holland as sacred, a symbol of fertility and eternal life. Maybe that's why so many turn to showbiz, to remain immortal and live inside legends. A book of parchment holds captive a story. The holly bears, red berries. You see it on every Christmas card you receive when people say, have a holly jolly Christmas. In World War I on Christmas Day, there was a Christmas truce between the British and the Germans. They repaired trenches and played football together. On the following day, they continued to kill each other. There's always a war raging and I'm sick of it. Each day pounds another nail into my head a sarcophagi of statistics and depressing news. To clear out the spiders and cobwebs in my mind, I go for a walk. Every time I leave the house, I say to my mother, I'll be back, hopefully. For even in the supposed moments of peace, I'm always looking over my shoulder. A deep generational paranoia is embedded deep inside me, deeper than the concerned brow on my forehead. Whenever a car slowly drives past me from the corner of my eye, I keep alert. It always hurts more when someone who looks like me shoots a hateful eye and stare at me. It's bad enough I have to deal with the white folks, the craft beers, their can I help you, can I help you, their goddamn pedigree dogs and their babies and their yoga pants. Now I have to deal with someone who looks like me armored in their car, 
and who knows me and no one else. That's what keeps me in line when I go for a walk, knowing if I say what's on the tip of my tongue, it may be my last breath. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, now, thank you so much, Cipriano Ortega. Sacred Voices, and very important, uh, has a show every second Friday on KGNU's Metro Arts from 3 to 3.30 p.m., um, produced by Aston Lopez, sitting next to Cipriano right here, KGNU in the place. And Sacred Voices just, I really wanted to be able to say those words in association with what we had to talk about here tonight. Um, to get further into that, we want to uh, introduce our main featured speakers here to talk about the book, The Holly, the history that added up to this, and uh, the present and future that is now going on. Joining me here on stage, Terrence Roberts, the central character. And joining us by Zoom, Julian Rubenstein. Um, we'll do some quick little introductions. Um, Julian Rubenstein is an award-winning journalist, author, and documentary filmmaker. Uh, his new book, The Holly, Five Bullets, uh, One Gun and the Struggle to Save an American Neighborhood, is a New York Times editor's choice. Book list called The Holly, Quote, a shattering piece of investigative journalism involving street gangs, race relations, and law enforcement, and named it to the best books of 2021 list, as did the tattered cover. It is a finalist currently for the Colorado Book Award, and now a documentary film directed by Julian. The book is just out this week in paperback, we have hardcover copies available, provided by the book bar. And uh, so Julian joining us by a video. Um, Terrence Roberts um, is a son of Denver, raised in the Holly. Uh, incredibly influential activist who has just now uh, or tomorrow officially doing a mayoral campaign kickoff at the city park uh, boathouse, correct? The pavilion, yes, sir. The pavilion. Um, and so this is all part of a lot of things moving on right now. And we're gonna learn a lot more about Terrence as we dig into clips from the film and this conversation. Um, so uh, Julian, if you wanna come off mute, I'm hoping we're gonna get you to the speakers. Yep. Can you hear me? <clears throat> sounds good. I'm also the engineer here. So if I dip away, I'm adjusting sounds. And yeah, a lot of hats here today. So um, let's just start with the beginning of uh, this book's process. And so I'm going to kick this to you, Julian, to start off um, how you came to write this book. Thank you, Damon. Just first of all, thanks to KGNU, Independent Media, um, and um, to the Buell Media Center there, Sexy Pizza, Kayvon for providing that. And know there was a beer sponsor who I'm forgetting. Unfortunately, I'm not able to drink those nice beers. Hopefully you're enjoying tonight. Um, and, and, and I want to apologize sincerely to everyone. And I um, luckily I'm feeling better today, but a little uh, tired, but I'm happy to be here, but sorry, I'm not there with you in person. Um, so thank you for coming and for your interest. Um, I'm, uh, well, I came to this just in brief. I, you know, I, I moved, my family moved to Denver in 1971, dating me a bit, I guess, but, uh, I was two years old. Um, and, um, I left, uh, after high school and I moved back for this story in 2014, 
uh, my family is here. Some of you know my brother, uh, who's the Mesa County DA prosecuting Tina Peters. <laughs> He's been in the news a bit lately. Um, and uh, <laughs> and uh, in any case, it's it's uh, the story has taken me back to Denver. I didn't know uh, how kind of quite that would happen, but it all started when I saw a story in the New York Times about the shooting that's at the heart of this story. Um, and that was uh, that Terrence had uh, at, at that time, who had become an activist, but formerly was a gang member uh, in Park Hill, grew up there and had shot someone at his own peace rally <clears throat> in 2013. Um, and I was very interested in the story for a few reasons. I mean, it just seemed like there was a lot going on. It was not clear to me from the voluminous media coverage what really was going on. Um, and I managed to reach Terrence, who was at the time out on bond, um, awaiting trial on serious charges um, of attempted murder, um, assault, and uh, a previous uh, offender with a weapon. Um, and uh, in any case, I, I started to talk to Terrence and I started to then talk to people in the community. There's a clip actually that you can tell me, Dave, when we would show it, but it shows a little bit of my. Um, uh, sort of how I started coming into the story. One of the reasons I was in increasingly intrigued was that I, as I became more involved in reporting the story and trying to find out more, it was just diverging with so much of what I was seeing in, in the public media at the time. And uh, I was trying to understand what the discrepancies were and why. And I also found Terrence himself to be um, someone who symbolized so much of the struggle that Black men have had, not only recently, but over generations. And he was also involved, of course, in the um, a significant high-profile redevelopment of this historic uh, piece of Northeast Park Hill known as Holly Square, which had been a big part of the civil rights movement in Denver, was a revered community in the Black community. And yet publicly had a sort of a appearance as a, or, or a reputation as a, a sort of a place of drugs and gangs, but yet also had this significant connection to activism. Um, and I was trying to understand all of that. And when I was getting deeper into it, what it seemed to me was the only way to try to understand exactly what really was going on and what happened on the day of this peace rally was to try to understand the community. And so it took uh, many years. It's now actually eight years since the since the day I started um, the project and uh, the documentary is about to come out. The book is is out. Um, and uh, it was it was uh, a remarkable story that I think is uh, shines a light on some things in Denver that, uh, in fact, the reaction to the book has frankly underlined to me all the findings in it. Um, how all of the falsehoods that are being said about it and from where, and I hope we can get into that. And um, as well as sort of the, um, the, the uh, attempts to suppress uh, the reality of certain stories and situations and incidents that are deeply important and uh, not only to our community, but, but to hopefully a free and just and social justice type of society that at least maybe some of us still want uh, to have. So I was absolutely, um, you know, committed to the story on a level that at times, you know, was very difficult uh, because it was not an easy story to report. Um, but uh, I'm glad that I am where I am now at the, on the other side of it. Without a doubt. So um, thank you, Julian. So Terrence, let's, um, could you describe for us what it was like growing up in Park Hill? and you know like all the way up like through your teens when i was a younger kid it was it was almost like a black mecca if that makes sense you know south of us it was more like affluent white people but we didn't have a problem with them their kids were our friends we all grew up together so like let's say like in communities like los angeles or chicago black people may grow up with more latinos or other polynesians or other people of color but in northeast park hill it just so happened that just south of us, it was an affluent community, but their kids listened to hip hop like we did, went to East High School, went to George Washington High School, went to Smiley Middle School, 
so we knew these kids and we played with them, but we were more north east and it was it was poverty <laughs> in northeast Park Hill, the same type of poverty you would see in bigger cities, and it was all black. So it was that duality there that we grew up with. Uh, it, it was great. It was the Kool-Aid man would come, like the literal, remember the Kool-Aid man who was like the jug, you know, like he would come and break dance and you go to the holly and see the Kool-Aid man break dancing and different things. And they would like bust open the fire hydrant, like that type of existence as a kid, you know, where all the kids have the fire hydrant going and the girls were doing hopscotch. And then literally as crack started coming in and cocaine and, you know, people started leaving Northeast Park Hill. It became a little bit more violent, and then a little bit more violent, and then some of our parents started using drugs, and then the gangs came, and then it went from like this, this kind of black Mayberry RFD, it wasn't perfect, but it was a great place to be. Um, black revolutionaries, the music playing, Michael Jackson playing all throughout the Dahlia, the Holly, to now it's a war zone. So when I was eight or nine years old, it was this place, it was this nicer place. By the time I was 14, I was already joining the neighborhood gang. It was already established a few years before, um, and there were drive-by shootings. And you know, it was a violent place. It, it it went from one extreme to the next in a matter of four or five years. So, um, as Julian mentioned, you know this me this story has a lot to do with media. And when you read the book, The Holly, a term is introduced which is that this is about invisible Denver. We're gonna look tonight at what are some of the factors that make this part of Denver invisible? And I think this is a great time to introduce our first clip where um, we're going to see a little media coverage of some events and then talk about some disparities there. Uh, sure. And let me just share my screen in a second, just to <clears throat> introduce it briefly to say that the book um, is a multi-generational story, uh, takes place over, it, the, it starts in 1955. I mean, it opens with a big sort of scene of the shooting, the day of the shooting, but it ultimately then opens in 1955 when Terrence's grandmother fled Arkansas uh, during the second wave of migration and came um, like some you know, several thousands of people uh, in the so-called exoduster movement and had come to, uh, although the exoduster involved some other states as well, but uh, it, it had uh, ultimately they uh, arrived in, in, in Denver, a number of African-Americans who were the, at that time um, not allowed to live just wherever they wanted, in fact, and this was just only in the 50s. Um, and Terrence's grandmother was uh, one of the first people, one of the first Black people allowed to live in Northeast Park Hill, and she moved there in 1960. Um, in any case, the book, um, the, the movie, the film, the documentary is more or less the third act of the book. Um, it's uh, primarily a verite documentary capturing uh, actual things that I uh, was witness to uh, during the reporting of the core of the book. There's a lot of research uh, around it to, to fill out that multi-generational story. Um, but we had, uh, just to tell the feature, a more of a sort of direct um, line of, on Terrence and his, uh, the shooting case and, and um, <clears throat> his attempt to uh, save himself from prosecution on this. And when I arrived anyway, this is a short clip um, I can show about uh, from an earlier an earlier section of the film. <clears throat> and it, uh, yeah, well, I guess I'll let it speak for itself and we can talk about it on the other side. Share my screen here. The local media was full of stories about the case. None of them seemed to give much credence to Terence's assertion that he'd feared for his life. Some featured anonymous sources suggesting Terence wasn't the peace activist he claimed to be. Terence told me a different story. Listen, Julian, I have all these forces coming against me, and still do. And I've been 
barely survived, and I have to shoot a man five times, and I'm barely alive. That's how intense the movement was for them to crush me. I didn't know if I trusted Terrence. But as I began talking to others in the community, it became clear that there were serious questions about what happened and why that weren't being asked. The day of the peace rally, Terrence called me. He said, Pops, I need you up here. I said, OK, I'll be there, son. He said, hurry up, because I don't want to be by myself. I think that they're about to do something to me up here. I knew he was in danger the day he started marching. The day he started speaking up, he was in danger. The beauty of it was he knew he was in danger. I think he was making a lot of noise, and I think he was stepping on some people's toes that he shouldn't have. And some of these people have a lot of power. I don't know where the directive came from, but in my opinion, what happened came down from a higher, higher source. You know, I was in his situation, I'm going to do the same thing. And I'm not just going to shoot one. If there's four or five, I'm going to make sure everybody catches something. That's just it. You have to. Uh, did, did you all hear that, I, I hope? Yeah, that was great, Julian. Thank you. OK. And actually did introduce Hassan, who um, is the young man that Terrence shot the day of the Boys and Girls Club opening, the peace rally, and when all of the events came to a head. Um, and all of these big factors came together. So when we say the Boys and Girls Club grand opening, I'll give you a little background on that. There was a big arson at the Holly Shopping Center uh, that was done by Crip gang members to destroy the headquarters of the Bloods in Park Hill. Ter Terrence stepped into this void and the smoking debris in order to bring positive activity and had the vision to do basketball courts in the footprint of where the um, building was burned to the ground. Um, that then led to Terrence coming with the idea that there should be a permanent um, youth center. And this idea was then morphed, and I think, Terrence, you can tell us a little bit about how um, that idea became a reality that then you were um, not invited to really participate in fully, though it was your brainchild. Yeah, so uh, after the Crips burned down the Holly, the arson, the rubble sat there for over a year. I don't know if you guys remember the cartoon He-Man, but remember Castle Grayskull? Just how dark and, and evil it looked there. It was very, it was a very bad place. We had kids literally playing in the rubble. They didn't even clean the liquor bottles out from the liquor store. <laughs> they left charred um, um, piping that, that was sticking up, copper pipes. Um, galvanized steel piping from old piping. They left electrical wiring there. It, nothing got cleaned up. They just let it burn down. They just they just threw a fence up around it that was like four feet high. You know, we, we have homeless youth over there. We have youth that are in gangs. We have youth whose kids were, I mean, um, whose parents were just not parenting them, them well. And that's not the whole community, but there's a, a, there's a component of that in all communities. So these kids, you could pull them to the holly. These kids were literally sm smut all on their faces from playing <laughs> and this arson. And this was a huge building. It, I mean, it, it took up quite a few acres. So we were advocating. So people were coming to me because now I'm the new face of activism. I had a couple of articles. I had no money. I had no experience. I am fresh out of prison, a few years removed. I'm a guy who just, I, I had 11 kids in my after school program at Hallett Elementary on 29th and, and, and Jasmine. But people were coming to me because there was no face of activism. So I started um, advocating with then Mayor Hickenlooper about doing something, just, just to clean up the rubble. I'm like, this is a public safety issue. There's public safety dollars. Just clean it up. It, 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 this is the city's responsibility. But the city was telling me, you no, know, it's the landowner's responsibility 
but he didn't have the money to get it cleaned up and his insurance would not get it cleaned up. So now we're stuck. So I kept passing the buck to Hickenlooper saying, no, it's your responsibility. So I got on his nerves enough to where he um, introduced me to a man named Terrence Ware. And when he introduced me to, we call him Terry Ware, when we introduced Terry, um, when he introduced me to Mr. Ware, he knew my father, they used to do karate together actually. So he took a liking to me, we both are named Terrence and we spell it the correct way with an A. <laughs> That's my cheap plug for spelling my name correctly, but anyways. But um, so me, me and Mr. Ware, we were having meetings, we were having lunch, he was like, Terrence, what do you think we should do? I'm like, just, just clean it up. Because if you don't clean it up, then people are gonna think that, I, that I'm not doing my job. Cause now it's, now, it's, now it's on me and my family because I've told the community that I'm gonna push for this. So he ended up contacting the Urban Land Conservancy. They were a new upstart. Now they're not a new upstart. Now they have probably $100 million of properties around the city, but at this time they did not. And uh, they purchased the land. And when they purchased the land, they also agreed to get it cleaned up, which was our first victory. And that came off of our advocacy. And I'm going to say our advocacy. I was running the Prodigal Sun Initiative, but it was really me and my entire team. It wasn't just Terrence by himself, but I was the face of the advocacy. And once ULC purchased the land and cleaned it up, mm -hmm. I got a land use agreement for $1 a year from the Urban Land Conservancy to be a caretaker of the land. And then that's when I came up with the idea of putting the Peace Courts there. And I had someone who worked for Cronky Sports as one of my board members. So I was connected with the Denver Nuggets. So they donated like the glass basketball hoops. Um, we have Parks and Rec donate the other hoops on the other courts and we painted them. They were like rusted. I was like, I don't care what they look like. If, if they're metal, it doesn't care if they're rusted, we'll spray paint them. And they gave us some rusted hoops and we sanded them down in my office. The office me and Senator Johnston opened across the street so I could oversee the development. Um, we painted the hoops up. We um, got sport court to give us like a slight um, deduction on the price for the plastic basketball courts. We got the concrete leveled out. We, we just doctored it up and we turned this, this huge slab of concrete. To me, it was like this, a huge blank piece of paper. And we put these colorful basketball courts. We, they were regulation size, 83 feet with that out of bounds by 50 feet. Well, um, high school kids were playing on them. We were having basketball tournaments on them. It really changed the energy of the community. And one day I had a vision of us putting a youth center on the other side, on the east side of the basketball courts, because the land was there. And we were having discussions with the HARP committee about what to put there. And I already knew anybody who had $2 million to build anything here, I don't care if it was a, 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 a nail salon, ULC was going to build there because ULC is holding this property. They need to make money. They're, they're into real estate. They're not into community good feelings, right? So even though, you know, that's part of their mission, but their mission is developing for good feelings, right? So before anybody could come up with, with any investment to put there, because we were getting different proposals from people, and it was for ridiculous buildings, ridiculous things that I knew no one would be happy with in Park Hill. But ULC owned the land. And just because people live in Park Hill, I knew I had enough sense to know we're all going to be mad about this, but ULC owns the land, right? So that's what every protest that I grew up watching on, to show good times, different strokes. All these protests were around developers, people chaining themselves, like in the 70s, chaining themselves to the fence. And now it would have been that situation. So I had a friend of mine who was doing the muraling in the holly. We did the flames when we did the basketball court with the huge camouflage phoenix coming out of the flames. And we painted the building camouflage, um, the old blue fixing shop, just to beautify the community. We called it air room use development. So I had him draw this picture of what it would look like with the courts in the youth center, just to the east of it. And I hung it on my wall. Um, I didn't know how we were going to get one penny of this, these dollars. I cold called John Aragoni from the Boys and Girls Club. He happened to be sitting in his office. And he was like, who is this? You know, and I was telling him, I was like, my name is Terrence Roberts, sir. I grew up in Northeast Park Hill. And I gave him the demographics. It's 9,000 people who live here. A third of these 9,000 people are children. You know, it's an impoverished community. There's a lot of gang violence. This is how many shootings we've had, you know, um, per capita. And he, Mr. Everybody listened to me. Um, we talked a couple of more times. He was calling me. So he presented my idea to his board of directors. 
Libby Anschutz happens to be on his board of directors. And I came to my office one morning. They kind of tested me because he was like, well, what time do you start your day, Terrence? I was like, well, I get to my office from like nine to five. Like two weeks later, I came to my office, Libby Anschutz, Ted Harms, and Mr. Argoni were sitting in my office. I'm so glad I was not that late that day, but I was like five minutes late. So I walked to my office. They're like, hey, how you doing, Mr. Robertson? I didn't know who Libby Anschutz or Ted Harms were. I had never met them. Um, I didn't know much about the Anschutz at all, to be honest with you. And um, they introduced themselves and they were like, we want to hear about your idea. I showed them the picture. They asked me to walk them across the streets to the Peace Force that we have built. We spent over $300,000 in all total on those basketball courts. It was like a huge project for us to get that stuff done. Um, she seemed impressed. Mr. Harms seemed impressed. Um, Hassan and a bunch of the bloods were actually hanging out across the street on what we call the Red Wall, which is on the south side of 33rd and Holly, where all the bloods were hanging out. They seen the youth over there in all the red. I showed them the basketball courts, they listened, and they seemed impressed. And Mr. Aragoni ended up announcing to us a little bit later on that she had talked to her father, um, which is Philip Anschutz, and they wanted to give us $5 million to build the youth center in the community, and that's how it happened. So. Indeed. So, um, Terrence, I'm going to ask you to tell us a little bit about Yeah, let's clap that up. I see the hands going over there. <laughs> A huge, huge undertaking, and um, let's let's remember that urban development is at the core of this story. Um, the The next thing I want to talk about, um, Terrence, is you know, the Prodigal Son Initiative and the Colorado Camel Movement, and how um, your work was going with um, diversion work for at risk youth from. Uh, that were at risk of, you know, being indoctrinated into different gangs. Yeah. So uh, while while I was going to prison, I, you know, uh, I started. So one day I was still in the gang. I had really, I was tired of my life, but I had really no thoughts or didn't have an idea of what it would be like to be outside of the gang because now I was an adult and most of my life had now been over half my life had been in the gang. You know, so, but I knew I was tired of going to jail. I'm not that great of a fighter. I didn't like getting into fights, right? No one's like getting into fist fights. I had been shot a couple of times. I was still getting sick from getting shot in my back. Um, I have a huge scar right here. I've had a couple of surgeries. I got, I had a surgery when I got shot and I had another surgery because I had a bowel obstruction when I was incarcerated. So I was, I was really sick, physically sick. I was mentally sick. And I was looking at habitual criminal. I was looking at going back to prison for the rest of my life. I was just tired of the gangs. I literally watched a documentary um, on PBS actually about Martin Luther King. I had been to the mountaintop and when he predicted his own death less than 24 hours before he died, it, it literally blew my mind. It, it blew me away. I was like, Jesus Christ literally did not even predict his own death 24 hours before it happened. And I kept thinking about that like, this man, he wasn't even 40 years old, he was 39. I always thought Martin Luther King was like 68 or something, right? Like, because when you're younger, you just think of him as being this older person. But I'm 45 right now, I'm almost 46. He was six years younger than I am right now when he was assassinated. That's how old Martin Luther King was. He wasn't even 40. And all of this stuff which was going through my head and I grew up off of Martin Luther King Boulevard, just south of it one block. I grew up on 29th and Pontiac. I really didn't know who Martin Luther King was. No one really talked about him much, right? Um, I, I started, you know, thinking about my life, all of these different things. And it was literally that night I was like, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop gangbanging. And that next morning I told all my friends, my name is Terrence. And some of the guys in the jail, they were used to calling me Biz or Showbiz. That was my gang name for so long. They didn't really know. We would fight people or get upset if you called us our, our God-given names because our names were nerdy, right? To, Tough gang members, Terrence is not a tough gang member name. So I'm like, my name is Terrence. And one of my friends I grew up with, he literally started, he laughed really hard. He just laughed in my face, like, shut up. I'm like, no, man, my name is Terrence. I don't want you calling me showbiz. And it was, it was literally that next morning. He was like, what, what are you talking about? I was like, I'm serious. And they were laughing, some other guys who we were, because we were like all kind of Bible studying a little bit, but guys always Bible study or become a Muslim in general, right? So we were like studying the Bible. 
But when I had seen that about Martin Luther King, all these things just hit me. And I was like, no, man, I'm done with it. Call me Terrence. So they laughed at me. I literally moved my breakfast tray to another table. And they were like, this dude's acting really strange, but I was serious about it. So after a few months of us being in jail together, like, okay, Terrence is serious. Like, okay, Terrence. They were still making fun of me. I was like, okay, well, whatever. I went to prison. I got baptized in Canyon City. Um, I was the shower porter, so I got to go to all the all, all of these different buildings. And um, I had Latino gang members, white supremacists, Bloods, Crips, all these different gangsters because I was in all of the pods and they liked me. And I was I talked to all of them because I didn't have any gang restrictions. I could talk to who I wanted to talk to, and the Bloods didn't hurt me or saw me. I had that conversation with them because I didn't leave the gang in bad terms. I left the gang because I wanted to do something better for myself. So like no one assaulted me or anything. So when I had that freedom, um, once I got those guys together, I kind of felt like I was like, man, I'm onto something. Like gang guys really don't have a problem with me unless I'm disrespecting them, right? Or acting tough. But if I'm not acting tough and disrespecting them, I don't, they don't have, no one has a problem with me. So I made friends with, with, uh, with Jewish people, Muslims, all these different gang members, all these different people, religious people, and they actually moved me. I, I, I stopped the riot. So first thing was I had all these people come to my baptism, which was pretty weird. The second thing that happened was I stopped the riot. That happened in, in the pen because I had grew up with some of the guys who were initiating it. And they moved me to Pueblo, but not to people think it was like to the mental institution. It was not that. They had like this little prison experience they were doing. And they moved like 120 people from around Kansas City to this. It was the youth offender system, but they had moved some youth out, moved some adults and to fill this bad space. And I went there and I was able to just to just grow and just study. Um, you know, I've studied different religions. I'm not a religious person, but I do believe in Jesus. I do believe in, in God. And I started studying more about the Bible. Really, I kind of put other things inside. And I just started really more of my Bible studies. And then I had an idea to start my organization called the Prodigal Son Initiative. Of course, the story of the Prodigal Son is the son left, spent all his dad's money while his father was still alive. And, when he, you know, he was destitute, he was homeless and poor, he came back. His father gave him this royal robe and brand new shoes and this royal signet ring. And I was like, you know, that's the story that I want for my life. And I want to bring that back to Park Hill. So when I left prison, I was working at Einstein Bagels. And that was the first job I really ever had. <laughs> and I love that job so much. I still miss that job. Too bad it just doesn't pay enough. I would work at Einstein Bagels if it paid me like, enough to live on, right? But it does not. Um, I met so many people. So I got my 501c3 because I started my after school program. I had 11 kids. I took some kids hiking and it cost me 250 bucks. I had to get them granola bars and water and socks and all these different things. I was like, I can't, I can't afford to spend this money. So I'm gonna just apply for my 501c3 so people could give me like two or 300 bucks so I could take these kids hiking and rafting. So the Rocky Mountain News, before they went out, they had did a, a, a profile piece on me, put me on the front page. I raised $40,000 at Einstein's. And I was doing like after school party, like after school, like little get togethers at Einstein's where I would let the kids come in there and do rap contests and do their homework. Cause we were giving away like 200 bagels a night. I was like, I'm not gonna throw all these bagels away. Cause even though I was working near Cherry Creek High School off of Bellevue, assuming, me, but there were poor kids there and they were getting bullied by some of the rich kids. So I would let them come get free coffee. We were dumping gallons of coffee I was giving away 200 bagels to nonprofits, women's groups, homeless shelters. I would let the kids come and eat it. So Einstein's almost fired me, but it was for a good thing. <laughs> like one day I had all these kids in there, they were rapping, they were rapping, and we were, I'm throwing the bagels away, and the executives are knocking on the door like, excuse me, sir. They came in there, they gave everybody speech like, we can't, this is not a party house. We need to have time with Mr. Roberts. They were just like, Terrence, you're just too big for us. We love you so much, bro. You've outgrown this bagel shop. It just so happens, though, that the Denver Children's Home read that article and these two people, like a couple of days after that, came to me from the Denver Children's Home. And they were just like, yo, we read about you. We have these positions opening for education liaison. I, I had a GED from Canyon City. I did not go to college. And they were like, we just need you to talk to kids to go back to school because they're going to get arrested if they're not 16 and their parents can also get arrested. And so um, out of seven education liaisons, I did the best. I was talking to kids, I was picking them up. I'm like, school is cool. So I started my own little school is cool campaign. So I got all these kids to go back to school. With the money that I was raising with Prodigal Son, I actually ended up going full-time with Prodigal Son because the holly did burn down. Uh, my community presence was needed. 
Um, I had a board of directors that was fully set up and um, I had my bank account going and, and I started raising money. And, you know, that's really how the prodigal son got going. And then I was running prodigal son and it grew and grew up until the development of the hobby. Okay, um, so now I think that's a good background. Do you guys feel like that's good, solid history? Yeah. That's good history. Okay, so let's bring ourselves up to now the, um, the events that led to Julian uh, relocating to Denver and following this story, putting eight years of research into the book, The Holly and the Film. Um, this is a story that goes all the way up as high as you want to reach from humble beginnings. And um, so Julian, um, let's let's turn to you and um, talk about, so there was the peace rally where Terrence was targeted for a assault by a large group of members of his former gang. Now, this had been an escalating situation, probably. Would you agree with that? Yes, sir. That it had been um, tension ratcheting up. And there is evidence presented in the Holly book that Terrence was targeted for this assault by police informants. Um, this has gone unreported even to this day by any of the major media in Denver. People have definitely covered the Holly book. You have heard about this story, the urban redevelopment. Nobody has zeroed in specifically on police informants targeting Terrence for violence. So um, Terrence, give us a little bit about a little uh, background on that. So um, to continue, because um, I didn't want to make it too long, but he asked about the start of the camouflage movement which plays into what happened to me. So after I, I started my nonprofit and all these different things, I had took a, I had took a missionary trip to Port of Prince, Haiti. So I was in Haiti for a couple of weeks and they had like these Chinese UN peace tree, peacekeepers in Haiti and they were giving them camouflage clothing. So it is like there's these activists in Haiti. So the prodigal son kids, we were already wearing green and orange because like all of the streets in Park Hill are named after plants. The holly is a plant, Pontiac, ash, elm, so we were wearing green to represent the community. And then we were just wearing orange because the kids liked orange. It looked good, right? Like So um, when I went to Haiti, I seen like all these activists wearing these donated camouflage um, clothing from these UN peacekeepers. So I was just telling the kids that in the Prodigal Sun program, like, yo, these, these activists, they were doing what we do and they were wearing this camouflage and some of the kids, it was the camouflage was not my idea, it was the Prodigal Sun kids. So we had a lot of black and Latino kids in the program and we had white kids too from South Park Hill. And they were like, yo, the colors represent all of us in the after school program and the green stands for the green we're already wearing and it stands for the earth. So they were like, let's get some camouflage shirts because it represents prodigal son. So I was like, I'll get us a, a box of shirts. So I got a box of shirts, but they didn't have the orange and they had like this gold, I mean, this yeah, it was like a gold metallic. And our symbol was the hand of God holding up like the backdrop of Denver, that was our logo. So I got like this huge logo of it on the back and I got it on the front and the kids loved the shirts. So some of the parents and family members of the kids were bloods and crips, they were older. So since their kids or their nieces or nephews were in the program, they were like, yo Terrence, let us get some of those camouflage shirts. So I'm like, sure, I'll give you camouflage shirt, you know, whatever. So after a while we were giving out so many shirts, we were driving around town and we, see, we were seeing active crips and bloods. We didn't even know where they got the shirts from, but we were like, Dude, are they getting them made on their own? Because we didn't give out that many shirts. So we started seeing buds, cribs, older people, elderly people, babies were wearing our camouflage shirts with our logo on it. So we were like, man, like maybe we should just start something. So we started the Colorado camouflage movement to get some of the kids in the opposite communities together to start hanging out because cribs were not gonna wear red Bloods were not going to wear blue, but they all were wearing camouflage. So we were like, hey, even if it's hot pink, it doesn't matter what color it is. Like, if we can get all these guys together to wear it, like, let's wear it. And camouflage is cool anyways. 
it's cooler in red or blue, right? So we started wearing camouflage with orange, camouflage with gold. We started doing community events and we all had our camouflage. So we started having camouflage contests, like who has the best camouflage shoes and bandana art. So then I started going to active gang members because they started inquiring, like they started calling me. And I didn't even know some of these guys, but they were like, yo man, like these guys came over here and shot someone or they jumped on my sister and her boyfriend at the mall and beat them up really bad. Can you, can you talk to them? And I'm like, I don't even really know you guys, but I kind of know them. So I, I do what I can. So I kind of got put in the middle of this because there was no one else because these kids were in my program. And someone would be like, yo, my niece is in your program. This happened. Can you give us some money for tube socks? And I'd be like, bro, I don't raise money for tube socks, but we'll buy you some tube socks. Like we'll, we'll do what we can to help. So when that happened, um, we, we were able to do a peace march called Heal the Hood. It was called the Heal the Hood Peace March, where we had a bunch of Crips um, and people from the Five Points community meet at um, eat, meet on the Five Points. We had a bunch of Bloods and Park Hill people meet at our office in the Holly, and we literally marched to Colorado Boulevard, which is the divider for the Bloods and Crips. I didn't know what was going to happen. We, we just had a bunch of water there and a bunch of food, and we just... We just had a big old jamboree. We had a microphone set up like this. Our only rules were don't hurt anybody. Don't punch anyone or shoot anyone. If you're scared, don't come. If you're not happy, don't come. We had like hundreds of people came. And then we, we were like, man, we have a movement. That year, we had the lowest number of gang-related homicides in Denver since the 80s, since this was 2010. So um, we had gang numbers we're at an all-time low until law enforcement actually moved these bloods that I grew up with um, who were working for them into the Holly Square. And you can literally pinpoint pretty much from the day they moved in, um, gang numbers started skyrocketing. But for a few years, we had active bloods and crips listening to us. And we were going to meetings where some of those guys didn't want to, they didn't want me there. And, and it was not safe for me to be there. Um, I've been to meetings where guys we're, re we're wrestling guns away from each other. You know, they're tussling over a gun. Like, no, this guy, they, they killed our sister. And you got this guy here talking about peace, fuck him. You know, and I'm standing there like, and this is a whole family of uncles and brothers, you know, and we were in those moments, but because I was putting myself in those situations, the gang members were respecting me for that. So when we were doing these events, we did over 30 events in the name of the Hilda Hood movement, the Colorado Camouflage movement. The only time that anyone ever had to have to protect themselves or any act of violence was when I had to defend myself the day I shot Hassan. We had dozens of events. We're talking about well, hardcore gang members with guns everywhere. From Los Angeles, Chicago, from Denver, all over. Um, no one ever struck anybody or dishonored anybody in dozens of events until law enforcement, and I'm not against the police, but there was a group of rogue police who were working with these gang members in an improper way. And when they implanted them into the hood, the Park Hill, our community, um, it destroyed the, the balance of our cohesion of peace. And they talked Hassan and those young men into jumping me, which now we're still in the throes of a gang war that started from literally when law enforcement moved these guys into the community. And that's a bigger conversation, which hopefully we can have, but yes, we were keeping the peace and we were lowering literally dozens and dozens of homicides in the city and assaults by just having these guys wear one common color, which is camouflage. And, and we were just in, imparting peaceful messages into them. And they were respecting us as activists, not because it was grid, not because we were 501c3, not because we had a bunch of funding, they respected us because we were grassroots and we were respectful to them and we gave them the power to stop the shootings because you, you can have a thousand police officers driving around LA or Denver or Chicago, but yet young black and brown men and also working class poor white men and women who are also joining African-American and, and Latino street gangs, that's who's getting slaughtered in the streets. And they're the ones who have to make the decision for their own selves to not shoot the gun or not put themselves in that predicament. And when we went to them with it and said, can you guys please stop the violence? They said, yes, we'll, we'll put the guns down. 
as long as they don't come hurt us. And it worked. It worked until we were interfered. Julian, I'd like to turn to you and um, have you fill us in um, some of what your research revealed about the use of police informants. Um, how, uh, how are these programs administered? Is there any transparency? Like, what did you discover about how police interact with and um, hire active gang members? All right. Sorry about that. Uh, so it's a very broad, broad question, but only because there's, uh, of course, informants are part of uh, law enforcement. They're part of law enforcement efforts. They're actually part of a huge number of uh, uh, uses, including getting, you know, um, motions to um, search or uh, people getting evidence to get a judge's order on things. But let's talk specifically about gang efforts, anti-gang efforts. And I would, I would just say that, I would say that this, certainly this book, um, and which is really multifaceted because it's, and the, uh, Terrence covered so many areas, I was sort of not sure where to chime in, but I would not one area I would mention though, is just that I think the book definitely charts like the sort of relationship between activism and violence over the years and the relationships between, you know, how activism and, 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 and gang violence are, are, are kind of connected. I mean, we can go back to the, to the civil rights era to look at, you know, what happened after the, uh, groups like the black Panthers were taken down and the void that was left there. And, um, how even uh, uh, previous members of street gangs had given up that to join these uh, uh, efforts, including the Black Panthers. But um, to zoom all the way back straight uh, forward to what's going on today is that, I mean, I really uh, think and hope that this book and this film is gonna enter a very you know, important conversation about how um, municipalities, Denver, like others, approach how to fight gang violence. And there's a real question going on, you know, really across the country, because unfortunately, it's not only in Denver where we had a, some pretty significant problems in the way the anti-gang effort was being run. Uh, it's also quite similar issues have gone on <clears throat> in other cities, which is when active gang members have been used and have there's been a number of problems that have arisen, including fear in the community, including problems between other uh, gang members and former gang members from previous issues that they had, um, and including that uh, they, whether with police approval or law, I should say law enforcement approval, we're talking about the police, but these efforts are multi-agency task forces. A lot of these um, informants are working either for federal agencies and or local police. Um, often those multi-agency task forces basically work, are, they work together and that, and that way they can get more money, more funding and, and harness more of the power that, that they hope to have. Um, for law enforcement, the use of informants and active gang members is, is, is presumably, and, and well, as, as, as many of them believe, and of course, by the way, the book, I had many, many law enforcement sources, um, many of whom are not happy uh, with the way things went in Denver in this particular case in particular, and uh, are questioning right now the way that Denver um, is, is running its program. I should say, by the way, importantly, that this entire project is totally independent, despite a lot of the falsehoods that are out there, including that I paid Terrence it, that is not the case <laughs> at all. And uh, in fact, I investigated Terrence as, as, as significantly as investigated anyone in this book. Um, and the book is very nuanced, by the way. And, you know, Terrence and I don't agree on everything and that's fine. Um, uh, you know, he's, uh, he's his own person and I thank him for allowing me to um, you know, portray his life and over the years and, and to be able to, uh, get the access I had that enabled, you know, that will enable us with the film and it has with the book to um, see some things that are actually difficult to, to access um, on that intimate level. 
Um, but with the anti-gang efforts uh, right now, the question of the use of active gang members is, is definitely a controversial one. Um, the city of Denver doesn't really want to talk about it. They keep obfuscating and um, sure with me, they wouldn't even give me their granular budget, which is public record, yet they refused. You know, these are also, as as I said to a few people who are watching uh, a screening of the film a few days ago that um, I offered the DA, Beth McCann, the police chief, Paul Pazin, and uh, our mayor, the opportunity to have a courtesy screening of the film because I thought that all of this work, which at times felt like government oversight that was not being done, should be of some value, but they are not interested. And to me, that says a huge, huge amount. Uh, and it sort of underlines the problem we have here in Denver with our elected officials and their lack of care of even seeing the problems that are going on. So that's unfortunate, but perhaps conversations like this will allow people to be more informed and be able to make better decisions perhaps about um, public officials and, uh, and, the, and the issues that are going on around us. Um, the movie and the book certainly uh, is a is a is a it's a messy gray area that we that we see a lot of you know issues. There's no one easy solution uh, to this. But um, <clears throat> if we just as a sort of a to put it in a context, I guess I would say that Terence is sort of on the side on one side of. A, uh, philosophy that believes that um, that law enforcement efforts are not necessarily helping um, in the communities they hope to serve. Um, some things that sort of, you know, support that theory include that law enforcement does uh, measure their success by data that include such things as arrests, um, but not such things it, it, like the programs and the, and the, the specific uh, efforts. And they do not, for example, you know, just target, for example, reducing, <laughs> as the police roll by, um, reducing gang violence uh, itself. Um, and just to say that, you know, despite, I guess, a report from the Denver police about some incredibly low reduction, like plummeting all way, already, no gang violence or almost no gang violence in Denver, I'll just say that everyone needs to understand that the way that gang violence is measured and recorded here in Denver and in a lot of uh, areas um, is not really helping us understand or address this situation. Um, for example, the shooting between Terrence and Hassan Jones, that's at the heart of this book as one example, which is a case that by the time you get to the end of this film or the end of this book, you will clearly see is, was heavily gang related. Not according to the Denver police, it wasn't. They walled off the gang department so they would have nothing to do with it and, and investigate it as a non-gang related incident. <laughs> Again, <laughs> read the book and you'll realize how crazy that is. Um, so the, and the other reason, for example, is that often in traditional recording of such measures for these statistics, gang violence means one group versus another group in inter-gang violence, like blood versus crip or something. Well, these days, um, in intra-gang violence, like a blood who is doing some violence against another blood or, you know, internal stuff, which has become more predominant even than the other, that's not gang violence. If a crip kills a crip, that's not gang violence. If a crip kills a blood, gang violence. Now, there's many, many other reasons why the police don't record these things as such. Of course, public relations is one of them. Um, so in any case, we don't get a very accurate picture from our officials about these pretty vital things that are happening regarding the health and well-being of our most vulnerable communities. So um, there's a real issue at, 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 at hand about whether or not uh, using active gang members in anti-gang programs is a good idea. Um, and the, uh, this, the, 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 the idea that they might help, of course, is that they have a sort of a, a background with, with these um, vulnerable youth and that they might be able to help them because they can identify with them. Um, and the argument against that, one of them certainly would be that 
just alone, one of the things that that it would help reduce gang violence is to help reduce gang affiliation, gang membership, and the the frankly the the uh, um, economic inequities that drive people ultimately into these situations where the gangs become their family and they're involved in in a criminal element and what they need and what can help anyway that certainly i've seen and uh and and others have seen is is good role models so it certainly is hard for an active gang member to be a great role model for a youth who may or may not become a gang member or who is already involved and that again is something you will see quite vividly come to life in uh in this film as well as in the book um so i would just say that that's a it's this is a a story that goes to the heart of a very important issue that <clears throat> apparently no one in denver wants to talk about um but should be talked about thanks julian so i feel like uh we're on time for another clip if you can um, maybe set us up for the next um, piece of the Holly documentary that uh, you'd like to share with our audience here today. Well, let's clap for Julian, by the way. Not for what he said, because that's horrible. Thanks everyone again. I'm so, I'm so sorry and really annoyed. I'm not there with you, but I'm glad I'm virtually with you. Um, I can't see you, I don't know. Uh, who you are or how many people are out there, but thank you. I'll give you a glimpse, here we go. Okay, let's, thank you, great. Let's take a little pause for the cause. Yes, nice, nice, okay. Thank you, hello, <laughs> cool, right on. Nice to see you all. Uh, so, well, Dave, just give me a, a, a just cause I, on time, you tell me, we've talked about two others, would you, there's the one, uh, with with Terrence's father George runs up into the into the youth and that we've discussed. There's another scene with Terrence and his lawyers. Do you have a, a suggestion? Um, let's let's bring George in. George is a very important voice generationally, and I think um, an incredible screen presence. So yeah, Terrence and his father coming up next. Sure. Um, thanks. And. Uh, <clears throat> The only thing I'll say by way of introduction is that uh, this movie is dedicated to George Roberts, who passed away uh, in 2021. Uh, so here's the first scene he is in in the film. And I'll share my screen. I don't want to die in my sin. I was in Oakland, California. My son Terrence can tell you, he used to come to Oakland to see me. I was one of the biggest ballers. I gave it all up. I gave Oakland up. I came home, not because I didn't want to be a dope dealer no more, because I was afraid that I was going to OD in Oakland, and I didn't want to come back in a box. What is it about me, Lord, that you love me so much that you stopped me from doing cocaine? I know I'm doing wrong. I know I'm living foul, but my God still keeps me. I've been a funeral director for 36 years. I do a lot of the homicides in the city. This bag is so full, I had to start putting them in, in this box. Family members, friends, foe, strangers, I've done them all. This winter, we had a lot of gang violence in the community. It's the young kids. I've watched them grow up, and I know how these kids think. These kids want to be gangbangers. They don't want to go to school no more. They don't want to obey their parents. But they love Terrence I'm Roberts. I'm meeting him Thursday. My name is Terrence, by the way, my man. I'm Bully B. Nice, nice to meet you, homie. Me, dog. Mm -hmm. um, let me ask this to you. If I found you a job, would you work? I'm blood. Oh, yeah. Me too. Yeah, you will work, so you will get out. I'm off. You will work a job. Hell yeah. Hey, we would like jobs, homie. Shit. 
niggas out in these streets is struggling, nigga. Our, our people, homie, we gotta feed our family, nigga. Our moms, Six brothers and sisters. Our moms and sisters, moms. blood. We ain't got dads, nigga. And if we do blood, where they at? Prison or dead, nigga, or running the ground. Blood, Shit, nigga, so y'all give us one strike and expect us to do something, blood. What we supposed to do but gang bang? You already know we got much love for all of you brothers. So we over there at the office, the, at the Park Hill Community Center. Y'all come through there, we're gonna get you a job, I promise you. Watch yeah. and see. Who we be? Ah. Fuck a Rick and I'm in the hood, posted up with the G's. Don't give a fuck, nigga. Yeah, I ain't by the knees. We be posted on the block, blood banging with that red flag. Dicky sacking on my waist, I keep a black mag on the blood, don't part. I ain't banging Native artists, making money, how When you a gangbanger, you in a war. <clears throat> uh, so that was actually three out of four of those young men are, are dead of gang violence. And we were unable to confirm the whereabouts of the fourth. But in any case, um, that does give you a sense both of some uh, of, of the realities of how young um, these young men are and how much they actually would rather do something else um, and how hard it is to get out and what the risks are. And it also shows, by the way, one of the reasons why I was determined to do this as a film, as well as a book, which was to really twofold. One was that as I started reporting um, critical events that were important to understand what was going on, uh, not only with Terrence's case, but kind of with violence in the neighborhood were happening right just right in front of me. And so I uh, was interested in, in trying to film. And as well was that Terrence, through his organization over the years, had managed to film a number of um, events and scenes that were just incredible uh, to me, like the one uh you just watched and i thought that it had a lot of value to um bring uh powerfully to people what kind of uh um situation a lot of these kids are dealing with so um terrence i want to get give you an opportunity um that was a lot of emotion packed into a small clip there um and really the senses of loss the basketball courts behind these young men are gone. These young men are gone. Your dad passed away um, after the launch of the book, um, but just recently. And um, so, and Dave, let me add what else? Let me add as as Terrence uh, starts. Just one other thing that's gone in that scene, and we talked about it earlier, uh, but which is the uh, all of the the church, the the apartment where Terrence, uh, sorry, where George lived is on uh, uh, roughly 30th and Stout. That whole area is now completely gone and is all new condominiums. So it's also, that's part of five points actually where, where you just saw George and the church preaching and, <clears throat> and uh, where, his, uh, pre, where his apartment used to be. I mean, it's, uh, it's amazing to how just in a short period of time and in that clip we watched, like you say, all of those people are gone and all of the places you just saw are gone. Yes, um, it is emotional for me. I don't, I've got tears in my eyes. I don't normally, you know, cause I have that clip personally myself, but I, I, I grew up with all of those young men's parents. I knew them when they were little kids. They're my son's age. My oldest son's 27. They're his age and younger than my son. They're all dead and they're not the only ones. There's dozens of them. They're all gone. They're either murdered or they're locked up. And some of the ones from that particular generation from from 2010 to around 2020, they're paraplegics. They're not mentally fit to even sit in this room with us, some of them, because they're traumatized. There's all kinds of things going on with that generation. We literally lost an entire generation of youth due to this gang war that sprung up from police using these dangerous older men, acting like they're getting guns off the streets, acting like they're stopping the violence but you have a rapist on the streets to get guns off of the streets. Make it make sense. So it's okay for him to rape women, 
but you want him to tell on his friends to get two guns off the streets. That is destroying a community. So, you know, we're talking about Black Lives Matter. We're talking about racism. So, you know, the media and other people want to want to act like, oh, these Black Lives Matter. I'm not talking about Black Lives Matter, the organization that just spent $6 million on the match. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about Black Lives Matter, the movement. No disrespect to those people either. I don't know what they do with their money. I don't even know them, but I'm just talking about the movement of Black Lives Matter, which we shouldn't even have to say Black Lives Matter. It's, it's ridiculous human beings have to say another human being's life matters to other humans, but we do, okay? In the context of this movement, we like to look at racism as, oh, it's a, it's a pot belly, tall white man from the South. No, it, it, racism is not just some tall white man with a whip from the South. Racism is systemic. It, it's not hiring a Terrence Roberts because I have tattoos of Jesus, mind you, and angels on my arms, but I'm too rough for real estate, right? Racism is, well, we're gonna give this organization this money because it looks cute. They're working with these kids in Cherry Creek, but even though we know Terrence needs this money to save his own life and to save these young men and women's lives, since it doesn't look good for the Denver Foundation, sorry, I don't know you guys are funded by them, no disrespect to the Denver Foundation, but a lot of political games are being played around where the money goes, who's kissing whose ass, what police officer dates what reporter, you know, I'm not, this is not a plug for my campaign, but this is one reason why I am running for office. So I'm playing a game. We, I've watched an entire generation of youth be, be slaughtered because I literally came against an urban camping ban. That's where me and Michael Hancock's, um, um, that's where our feud comes in. At. Because I was the first African-American to say, you're a handsome young black man. What are you doing with an urban camping ban? There's nowhere for these people to go, sir. You're forcing me to stand up to you. You're asking for it. Then when I stand up to you, you, you get these law enforcement people, because I am blaming Michael Hancock. It's his police force. He is the mayor of the city. Then they do, then they do eminent domain, him and Albus Brooks. These are two African-American men. Are they tall, racist white men from Louisiana? No, they're not. But they are working for a system with other tall white men who are like, you better do it, or we're developers and we're gonna do it, uh, we're gonna do an independent expenditure. You won't be married. I'm running for mayor because I don't care about being the mayor. More than I care about saving those youth. I'm sorry I'm emotional, but my father is dead. He wished he could be here. All of those young men are dead. I care more about saving those young men's lives than I do impressing rich white people, angry black people, or whoever, because we are still losing another generation of young black youth, young Latino youth, and poor white youth are joining street gangs and creating their own gangs, or they're becoming radicalized into racism. We just had a mass shooting in Buffalo where this young man was talking about this ridiculous replacement theory. It's gonna be a long time before black people replace white people in America especially when we're dying at the rates we're dying. In. It's a ridiculous theory and it's just to radicalize more racism and it's coming from the same sources. So no, I'm not against law enforcement at all, but when we have law enforcement officers working with known murderers, active gang members, not in a positive way saying, yo, young man, let me play basketball with you, put the bandana down. Let me talk to you about the benefits of law enforcement, not in a pro positive social way, but you're getting these older men who are known murderers, and then you're giving them taxpayers' dollars after they're on camera attacking me? That's ridiculous. And it shouldn't have taken Julian Rubenstein to move here from New York to report on this. He was fine in Brooklyn where he was. I thank God that Julian decided to make the sacrifices he made to do this story, because I don't know where my life will be because of all these false narratives because of the improper relationship between Denver police, Denver FBI and Denver ATF and the local media, they literally let active gang members who attacked me speak to the media about my character. Of course they're gonna slander me. I just shot their friend. I just, I, I, I just got out of a, a snare that they had planned for me that they fell in in their own. 
and they're feeling their own snare of, of me. So of course they're gonna slander me. And they just ran with the story. The Denver Post still has not reported on this book. Shame on the Denver Post. It's a ridiculous outlet, okay? The Denver Police are, are, are not giving credence to say, you know what, we know that we have bad officers, but we are a good agency. And what happened to Terrence and other activists in Denver, that's not what we stand for. They have not issued an apology to Julian. Julian has been threatened by African-American activists. This is ridiculous what has happened to the city. And I'm not angry. I don't want to seem angry you guys, but I am angry in a, in a, in a righteous way. I have a righteous anger that's inside of me because I love Park Hill. I love Denver. I can't even go to Park Hill. I don't know if you guys seen on Nine News. I go to Park Hill to talk about my life story. These same gang members that Julian reported on, they surrounded me. They tried to open my girlfriend Christabel's car door on camera to assault her. I don't know what they were going to do to her. It's me and her there with Nine News. People are laughing at me like it's a joke, but it's not a joke. These kids are getting killed in this city. I've worked in worse places in Denver. I've worked in Los Angeles. I've done work in Chicago. I, I, I've spent so much time in Haiti. I, I was praying to go home. Like, please, Lord, let me get on that plane in three days because I don't even know if I'll survive three more days. I've seen worse than Denver. We all have. Those young kids in Northeast Denver and in the West Side and in the North Side slash Highlands, if they're caught up in street gangs in this city of Denver, it is not safe for these kids. Law enforcement is not protecting our kids. Michael Hancock has taken a hands-off approach to development, to domestic violence, to youth violence, to our unhoused neighbors, to animal abuse, you name it, we don't see him. <laughs> Hancock should be here tonight. So, so that's why we're screaming save our city. Because some of you in this room, it's gonna be fine for you guys. No, no disrespect. So I need your support, but it's going to be fine for you. But what about those of you who is not going to be fine for you? Because some of you are elders, and just because you're white doesn't mean you have a lot of money. And I understand that. This city is failing right now. I think the city has a mirage of come to Denver is perfect, but it is so not perfect for anybody. And we need to break that stigma. And I thank God that Julian wrote this book because... I couldn't even do the things I'm doing right now with such a false narrative that was told about me and not for selling drugs, not for stealing money from my organization. None of that was reported because I wasn't doing any of those things. I was attacked by my own police department and even ex friends of mine who were working for them for doing positive things, for saving those young men's lives, not for being a scumbag. Those men are still in my office. The gang members that attacked, even after Julian wrote this book, it's an international piece of literature now. These men are still in my office attacking people in the Holly till this day. You could leave this building right now and go to the Holly, and you will see adult bloods, not some racist white man from the KKK destroying the community. These are black men standing around not the police are attacking them. <laughs> they're working with them, but they're arresting me, giving me felony charges for protesting for Elijah McClain. Make it make sense. And that's what we're talking about. Um, so before we turn to the audience Q&A, you know, I know you guys might have seen the uh, the index cards, uh, we're gonna grab this mic and set it up in the middle so we make sure to uh, get your get your questions through the speakers. And Cipriano has another poem for after the uh, audience Q&A. Um, Julian, I just want to turn to you briefly with a question. Uh-oh, low battery. We're gonna make this fast. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, what is, um, no, so Julian, tell us quickly about um, the, the targeting against yourself, the misinformation campaign, some of the forms that uh, the response has taken to the book and balance that with 
becoming, you know, having this book honored as a New York Times um, editor's choice and a lot of the accolades that you've received. What has been uh, your experience over the last year? Probably a big roller coaster. Um, <laughs> Sorry. Gotcha. Uh, yes, um, it has been a bit of a roller coaster. <clears throat> um, yeah, it's been great to have recognition in 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 certain circles, and it's been um, challenging uh, to face uh, an ocean of falsehoods, uh, intimidation um, from other circles, um, and it's also actually, you know, not only is it consistent and sort of underlines everything that I feel like I went through and discovered because it would be exactly what would be expected um, from people who aren't happy about, you know, uh, another story <laughs> coming out, such as the truth. Um, I, by the way, was just in search of the truth. Um, uh, and I had no idea what I was going to find at all. Um, and I didn't have any preconceived notions. Um, and, but uh, yeah, I mean, I would take it just since, let me see if I have <clears throat> a reference here because I want, I think I'm, um, where is it? Right there. Yes. Okay. Just here's, uh, you know, since um, it might give a little context, but uh, many people know an activist named Brother Jeff Fard. Okay, this is just one example of someone who is held up as an activist, and yet he has threatened my life. He's said on uh, his Facebook program, which he then deleted, <laughs> conveniently, interestingly, um, that he, uh, you know, better watch your back, Julian. How does your mother feel about you being a snitch, Julian? And then thought it was ironic that I reported it to law enforcement. <laughs> okay, well, you know what? My family is in, works in law enforcement. I have friends, many sources in law enforcement, I'm not against law enforcement. I'm against corrupt and problematic law enforcement. I'm against law enforcement who is unwilling to look at anything that someone might bring to their attention. And um, so, yeah, if someone threatens my life, I will report them to law enforcement like any normal person would. And I've twice reported to two agencies, brother Jeff Fard. I wanna shine a spotlight on this person because he's very misunderstood. I'll, I'll just, I wrote down a few of the things, for example, that this person who's in the book and he's in the movie, and by the way, no doubt does not like how he comes out in the book. I urge you to read it and to learn more about him and how he's reacted specifically in these situations um, that are in the book. Among the few things, few, a few of the many things that Brother Jeff Fard has said about me in the book, I pay, that are all untrue. I'll read you a many, a list of a, some of them. I paid Terrence Roberts. I never lived in East Colfax. I didn't see murder victims on my block. I didn't have a mentee who was murdered. Um, did I lose you all? <laughs> oh, man. Uh, are you guys there? Okay, uh, Julian, um, we're going to just do this old fashioned and uh, hold you up. If you are, are you with us? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Now you're just on the laptop. We've lost our TV. No, oh, okay. We haven't lost our will. So our... Uh, well, can I just finish my, uh, uh, at least a sentence or something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm terribly, terribly sorry about that. Um, okay, yeah, please go I ahead. I mean, I, just, just to finish, I mean, anyway, I won't, you know, go into the whole thing. I mean, it's, but... Uh, just since I was cut off at a pretty awkward uh, time and it was it's, it's a pretty sensitive and pretty important thing, I would just urge everyone who is hearing uh, things about this book that sound weird or negative or something um, to ask maybe who, why are they saying that? Jeff Fard is a perfect example. I would ask why might he 
be saying all of these falsehoods about a book that uncovers problematic things in the neighborhood he represents or one of the neighborhoods, certainly Northeast Denver. He's an activist who says he cares about that area. And yet all he wants to do is make up lies about me in the book and threaten my life. I want to say to everyone out there, who is funding Brother Jeff? We should ask ourselves, who is funding Jeff Bard? Why is he saying these things? And what is going on? It's very tiring. And it's really problematic for anyone who wants to understand the truth of what is going on. And I, I, I just encourage people to ask why when they start hearing these things. And thank you for hearing me out. It's been incredibly uh, frustrating and something that I will continue to point out if he wants to make himself such a featured spotlight of, of the source of the all of the lies about this book. Thank you for hearing me out. Thank you, Julian. Um, yeah, let's try. We're going to try another another cable here. I'll take I'll, if you guys have any questions for me, I'll, I'll take any questions. No, no, you're right, you're right, bro. Controversy about the book on humans or races and all these different things when Julian is a journalist who just didn't tell the story he wanted to make the tale. It has nothing to do with racism. I'm an African American civil rights advocate saying Julian is going to see him right now, right? Since he's a journalist. Do you know whether the documentary comes out and where we can see it? So it's actually taking great Friday and killing Friday and killing Friday. So we're all driving down there, seven hour drive. Um, but I don't know when it will be streaming on like Netflix or or something like that. That's more. I don't know if you can really know that. Um, but hopefully, it's streaming for this time. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Is it possible to make a copy of the book and then police, etc., publicly? Yes, you're actually naming the book. I do think. And I don't have evidence of this, but I, I, but I will say this, because of his relationship with law enforcement and the visual we were having, I do feel like mayor, the, literally the mayor of our city possibly knew, literally possibly knew off the physically assaulted the mayor of the city, uh, Commander Michael Callow, who was over the gang unit, but then was transferred uh, to District 2. We feel like he was transferred to District 2 to literally head up this group of Bloods and Crips. Um, to head up this this gang program, this anti-gang program, where they want to use active gang members. There are any names? Yeah, Michael Callow, Marion Cox. Are they um, named publicly? Are they named in the book? They're in the book, yes, ma'am. Uh-huh. Yes, they are. Maybe in other uh, venues also. I'll I don't know what happened. I mean, is there any more parents interested in doing it? But would it be possible to have a campaign of um, letters to the editors? Yeah, we've been trying to talk to them, more so Julian and like his team. Yeah. I'm the protagonist, so it's not for me to be calling him like, report on this book, report on this book, because that's more separate. No, I mean, letters to the editor for us. Yes, please to do. The so the Denver Post doesn't want to cover this, this story because Julian calls them out for letting active gang members not only one time continuously report on me. Sure. You know, and so he, when he put that in the newspaper, they were just like, well, we don't like that you said something bad about us. So yeah, we're not but if there were really an outpouring out, uh, of comments from uh, people in the community, they might understand that they're not going to get the full story. Yeah. Yeah. So I say do it. I think it sounds like a great idea. <laughs> yeah. Because they need it. Because the Denver Post is the only show in town. Yeah. You what know? about the TV station? Um, I do not have a good working relationship with Nine News. <laughs> so, you know. Um, but you know, Fox 31, they interview me a lot, not necessarily about the book, 
Local media has not really wrapped their arms around this book because Julian, as an outside independent media source, has called local media out in Denver for having improper relationships with law enforcement and with elected officials. They're all friends. Denver, so you go to Chicago or LA, there's five different machines to keep each other in check. But in Denver, it's just one big machine. And if they don't like you, if you don't, if, but everyone's progressive, right? But if you don't fit in with these progressive political people, and they're not just white, they're white people, are there's African American, they're black, brown, and white. But if you don't fit the cool kids club, you're done in this city. Ask Jamie Gillis who ran against him. Huh? It's another it definitely is a matter of the game. It, it's cronyism, it's nepotism, it's everything we don't want to see in the second pass of that scene in America. Then you wonder why the five points is the out of over 3,500 cities in America, it is the number one gentrified African American community in America. Mind you, like you say, what an African American mayor, not some old white Republican, not Donald Trump in office. Michael Hancock's in office right now when this is happening to us, right? You know, so um, it, it, it is a shame. Well, look at our airport. Please don't get me started because I can go on and on and on about the mismanagement of our city and what they did to, to really destroy my life, to ruin my life. It, it, what if I murdered myself? Well, what if I wasn't so hard headed and tenacious about saying, no, I'm not going to let them destroy me? Because I have children. That's my son right there in the orange t shirt. Okay? Like, what, what, what if I didn't want to, what if I didn't have the mental fortitude? I could have committed suicide. They ruined my career. They, they, they did take the development from me. That development, I'm not saying any me, it was literally my brainchild. And because I am a young African American who has passion, I speak with my hands. I don't know what the problem was, but they didn't want me to be the face of my own development. So they defunded me, pushed me out, and then they literally told a group of gang members, "Well, you guys handle them your way." But how do gang members? They just haven't said anything about it. And I'm concerned about the city council. I think city council needs to be flipped, but that's a whole. I don't understand how our city council continues to pass a budget where only 2% of our public safety is going to homelessness issues. 2%, but that is the number one concern for constituents in Denver, is our unhoused neighbors growing and living all in and around our inner city. But yet the city council continues to pass the same budget. We're just, we're just wasting so much money in the city, it's ridiculous. And, you know, as a media worker, I want to back up on te what Terrence is saying here about um, the collusion and the information. He has referred a couple times to an incident with the Nine News camera crew out, and you can watch a 17-minute unedited, uh, just raw footage off of one camera with, with a big confrontation with Terrence being approached by the gang members that are in the book who are uh, the so-called, uh, they have the after-school program there, and these are um, from the Crenshaw Mafia out of Los Angeles. And within that confrontation, you hear one of the chief guys right at the beginning say to the journalist, you about to see it, watch. And he's talking about provoking Terrence's outspokenness. And the um, interaction continues on back and forth, other guys coming in and out of the frame. Terrence is obviously feeling threatened and agitated. He's yelling at stuff, stuff at them, degrading their game. When Nine News, and then and let me finish with my favorite part of the clip, which is when a young man puts his face in the camera at the end and says, that's a bunch of nonsense. Come over to our office and see how it's really done. Um, so on the Nine News piece that ran, if you watch the two minute option, if you look up Terrence Roberts, Nine News on YouTube, they say Terrence Roberts was a, uh, got into a confrontation with these former gang members. But if you watch the entire clip that they had, when he's degrading their gang, they're not saying, I don't know what you're talking about, in a, or anything like that. They're just saying, like, no, no one says that to us. Why does Nine News need to identify these young men as former gang members in their coverage? It's to pull the wool over your eyes. 
And it, 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 they don't care what happens to the people in the Hollywood. They know about these folks. It's so that you don't know. So KGNU, we are here to not do that. This has been a wild uh, journey, not just here with putting together the media today and making this pivot, but getting to here tonight. We won't, you know, we try to hire security. We've done things that we never thought we would have to do. Um, but, you know, for those of you that go back with KGNU, we are the peace station. We are here to talk about lessening violence, making our communities better for everyone, especially those most at risk, those most marginalized, which these other forms of media deliberately are manipulating and piling like firewood. So let us uh, get some more questions. If anybody has anything, yeah, want to test it. Um, Julian, can you hear us, uh, Julian, at all out there? We, we reconfigured to hopefully get your audio back. Yes, yes, yes I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. And we can hear you now. We got you through the speakers. Okay, thanks. Great. So, <clears throat> yeah, just I was just going to add one thing regarding Nine News that, you know, it's as reported in the book. Um, you know, well, let's just let me start preface it by saying there's a lot of reasons that it's difficult for traditional media to cover a story like this, many of them are quite understandable, um, which does include that it, you know, it, it, this kind of reporting did take a long time. I, I, that's the kind of reporting I do. It's not really daily news coverage. Um, and also, of course, there have been problems in the media in terms of the redistribution of the way media uh, is operating. Uh, through uh, the internet, what the profit sort of margins are and how who's running the media. But at Nine News, um, they showed me that there was yet another issue that we're dealing with here in Denver and no doubt elsewhere, which is that uh, one of the criminal justice reporters covering Terrence's story, who um, <clears throat> was, let's say, very interested in meeting up with Terrence personally, um, and many times asked her, him about the documentary um, and uh, anyway turned out to be the wife of the ATF agent in the middle of a lot of the problematic things that were going on and that are being reported. Um, that to me is not only unethical, but um, that's using a tool of law enforcement as a plant in our media who's not saying who she is. <clears throat> She no, no longer works in Denver, thankfully, but now she's somewhere else. Um, it was uh, Whitney Wild was her name and the ATF agent that should take, everyone could take a closer look at is Christopher Ammon or Amon. Uh, in any case, these are other strands that people should be picking up on, but instead Nine News, not it, it, Nine News, just as every other television station in Denver, has not covered <laughs> the book um, at all, or me. Uh, the last book I wrote, just for a reference point, uh, was took place in Hungary. Um, and uh, it was, um, at the time I lived in New York, yet <laughs> I was on, I think, every single local TV station, as well as, the, of course, the Denver Post. But this book, which takes place in Denver, I live in Denver, and um, has not been covered by any of the Denver television networks, um, nor, of course, as mentioned, the Denver Post. And uh, again, I would just sort of uh, let everyone think about why. I'm gonna add some context to what he was saying about my news, but this is wild. Um, I know this sounds wild, but it's true, and I show Julie the evidence. So this journalist was acting like she wants to flirt with me and date me and be with me sexually. Um, I showed Julian this. I was not falling for it. I'm not desperate for sex or dating anybody. Um, he did some research on her. Come to find out her husband was the ATF agent that these gang members were working for that tried to attack me. So he called out nine moves for having this happen. They moved her out of town. So then years later, this other journalist contacts me via Instagram saying, hey, we want to cover the book. We want to put a positive light on your name. So she was like, but let's go to the Holly Square. I'm not thinking she's gonna tell these active gang members. And they called the middle man earlier, but the, I'm 46 in August. These guys are older than me. These guys are like 50 years old, still wearing red bandanas. 
on their head. It is, it is a ridiculous thing. This is their religion, okay? It is a cult. Um, they they asked me to go to the Holly, so I'm not sure. I mean, the incident happened literally almost 10 years ago. I'm not worried about these gang members being in the Holly, but when I got, when me and Christabel here pulled up to the Holly, that whole group of them were all waiting on us and they came up to surround me. And I don't have her phone for text messages, but we do believe that Alexandra Lewis with Nine News, she's an African American reporter, set me up to go to the Holly, but she told Jeff Farr, who's been threatening me. Julia's life, and he has a working relationship with these bloods, and he told them to meet me there. So I didn't know they were going to be there, but when they came, they surrounded me, and Chris Fidel tried to open her car door, and almost got into a fist fight. And was I yelling and disrespecting her game? Absolutely I was. I'm really sick of these active gang members murdering these kids, and getting them involved with gangs, pretending to be activists, and all of these kids are ending up dead. So I mean, I, I have no obligations to run from gang members or to be assaulted because I'm an active to try to run for public office. Now, I'm not going to be arguing with gang members and spending my time doing that all the time, but if I'm surrounded by gang members, if I feel like I have to defend myself, I will do it again. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to be martyred. I'm, I don't need to be an activist to get myself killed. I'm here to raise my kids, and I'm here to make sure that your kids and your grandkids have a safe city, not for someone to beat me up or murder me because I'm speaking against the gang violence and I want housing for all the No one these are exact, including myself. Well, by the way, I just want to add that I have no idea if Nine News set him up. I, I, it, I don't, so I don't know what, I, it's not, I can't hear exactly what Terrence is saying. It sounded like he said, we think, I, I don't know if that meant me, but I have no idea if she set him up. I, I, I really don't. I, 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 we I, does not mean Julian, let me put that out there. <laughs> We mean me and Christabel and other family members and friends of mine. And like I said, I don't have the hard evidence, but the Bloods are telling people that they knew I was coming up there. And the only person who knew I was going up there was me and the journalist and, and Christabel and her account. I think we had a question over here. If you wouldn't mind getting on the mic so Julian could hear it. Yeah, thank you so much. I have uh, two questions, one for Julian and one for Terrence. The first one to Julian is, um, I guess Terrence can answer this too. Just cu curious if the city or DVD or any kind of like official source has had any kind of response or comment to the book. Obviously there's a lot of good information in the book that's verified and researched and um, investigated. And so just curious if there's been any kind of official or maybe even unofficial uh, response to the book um, from the city or, or from DPD. And then the other question I had for Terrence is, um, it's been talked about a little bit just your safety and like how you've been able to move around and obviously you're running from there and what that might look like just being a public facing person. So just curious how your day to day life is been in the city. Okay. I'll let Julian answer your first question and I'll, and I'll answer some of that too, but I'll let Julian take a crack at it. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, um, no, there's. Uh, there's Whoa, I am hearing the echo now. <laughs> okay, now hopefully is that better if you can hear me. Um, uh, there's been no, certainly no official uh, response to the book. Um, <clears throat> I did try to, you know, see if there would be a response, not personally, but that there was, there were other reporters I know of who asked and um, were told that when the mayor was done reading it or whatever, he could comment, but that I don't, you know, to my understanding, I don't, that hasn't happened. Um, and, um, but I would only say that luckily I am glad that the U.S. attorney, the Colorado attorney general has read it twice. I know that Senator Michael Bennett has read it and uh, apparently it's mandatory reading in his household. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, and uh, uh, Senator Hickenlooper has been unwilling <laughs> to respond to many of his friends who want him to read it for whatever reason. I don't know, but, um, and um, I otherwise, um, yeah, I tried to, to talk to him about it, but he, uh, when I saw him one time, he didn't seem to want to talk about it. Um, and uh, let me think, uh, oh, that just the, yeah, and, but the, I was, I, I'm, I'm truly honored though, and I think it's important uh, that the U.S. attorney uh, here in Denver seat and I'm, and I am, and thank, I thank him that he's, that he is interested in seeing it as is the governor. Uh, so. 
<laughs> yeah, and um, so as far as him giving an official answer, some of them was called out like William said. So we have like, the Attorney General and other elected officials for getting out this story and being supportive. Um, I do feel like certain officers and like our mayor are using some of those same activists and same people who do kind of have like a power base and listening ears. They're not giving the official comments, but they're just kind of using their mouthpieces in the community like Jeff Farr to slander, to slander the vote. So that's my feelings about it. I don't know their personal conversations, but I know the people, I know their relationships, and I know the visual that's coming out of these people's mouths. So that's kind of their unofficial stance on the book is using these activists to slander the book. Um, and as far as my personal safety, it is not safe for me to be going where active gang members are. Like I don't go to the nightclubs where there are shady people and bloods and gang members. I'm not hanging out in the Hollywood Square trying to show that I'm tough and I can be around those guys. I'm not tough enough to fight a bunch of gang members, nor do I have a desire for that. Uh, but you know, I, I come places like this. We, we go to like the, the, the arts festivals, or I, when I'm protesting, that's more of my space. Like when I went to the Hollywood Night News, that was more of right now, I hate to say this, but the gang members, <laughs> as their space, the bloods. The community is literally like, they kind of own that space. Um, but when I'm protesting, I mean, we've had upwards of 11,000 people downtown to 5,000 people at the Aurora Municipal Center for Elijah McClane. And my family's there, my friends are here, so they would lose really bad if they came onto our community space, because it's not about me being tough, that means all of us. And when, when the community is involved, the gang is not that tough. The gang is only really tough when the community is afraid of them. So we've done a good job of me not going where gang members are shooting each other, hurting each other, and just doing what they do. And they've done a good job of staying away from us because I'm not looking for any battles or anything, uh, but I'm not here to be assaulted either. And I'm gonna defend myself or people who are in my care or around me because I, I, I am a protected person. And that's what we're asking our men to do is, especially in our community, we would, if we're complaining about over-policing or inadequate policing, is do we want to make a positive impact ourselves in our own community? Or do we want to always call the police and when the police come bust heads, we're calling them racist. What, what do we want? And I'm the person saying that to my own community. You know, so I just don't go around those guys. Uh, but when I am in certain situations, yes, I do have security. Uh, I don't always need security. Uh, tomorrow we do have the campaign kickback. Cheap plug. Tomorrow there's a campaign kickoff at the City Park Pavilion at 4.30. So we'll be there. We're, we're going to have armed security. We're going to have two armed security guards that are actually Denver police officers. Because our insurance said we have to have Denver police officers there. So yeah, in situations like that, I am around armed security. But in situations like this, we, we you know, we, when it's a community-based thing, I'm not as much worried about them because they don't really come to police officers. <laughs> I haven't had any problems until so nine months ago be here, and I fell for it, and I went. But other than that, since the shooting, I haven't had any incidents with these gangsters. Thank you. I just have I have a comment and maybe a uh, question. Uh, I think the first thing that really. Uh, me by surprise in this book was uh, the fact that the game started because of police harassment of young men. Um, there, would, there may not have been gangs. Of course, we have poverty, and that's the main cause, and the wealth disparity. And some of us who are healthier are responsible for that. We need to do something about it. The fact that the police started the game was shocking. And the second thing was I'm wondering about Bill Weiser, our Attorney General. I think Julian has been in contact with Mr. Weiser. Um, I actually like Bill Weiser because he got those officers indicted. Yeah. The pyramids who murdered Elijah when they were literally making fun of him, but that's my own personal feelings about Mr. Weiser. As far as the book is concerned, maybe Julian can speak more to the elected officials because that is more his realm. I'm not 
trying to inter interject myself into the book or the documentary in order to be able to protect us. Um, yeah, so Julian, the question at hand is just uh, about Phil Weiser. Um, what, what have you, um, what have been your interactions with the Attorney General? Well, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't think it'd be, can you hear me? Yes. No. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't be, I think, appropriate really for me to talk about, you know, my interactions with him, but exactly anyway. But I mean, I would just say that I um, appreciate that. I, I know he has closely read the book uh, twice um, and he's concerned, you know, about some of the things in it, uh, as I think anyone who reads it, particularly in, in any public official who reads it should be. <laughs> which again is so ironic and interesting that so many of the public officials, um, including city council, I mean, it goes again to the, the power of brother Jeff Fard and how people in elected offices are actually afraid to go against him. And he's made it very clear where he stands on this work, which is that <laughs> he is going to do anything to uh, undermine it, including lie about it and threaten me. <clears throat> so uh, other people who like Phil, who have shown a clear interest in it, I do appreciate it. I don't think, I mean, there's really nothing more uh, for me to say. I have gotten to know him and I, and I, and I, appreciate, I appreciate his interest. And ma'am, I think, you know, just from, from my view, um, when you say that, you know, the police started the gang situation, um, I think what the policing did was create a leadership vacuum in the black community through the undermining, targeting, and um, informant uh, presence within the Black Panther Party and other um, extremely radical social groups instead of um, politicizing their work, they criminalized them. There was a tremendous fomenting of violence within the political groups of the late 60s and early 70s. So for our generation, this left a big leadership gap. And when gang violence and gang membership became a thing in Denver, all the young kids were in you. Um, it was the thing. What school do you go to depends on what uh, gang runs it. And all these young kids, it was just like the hot new thing. So uh, it was a popular culture thing, and it has incredibly destructive uh, repercussions that have not slowed down in any way. This has become urban America. And this year, we're climbing towards record gang violence um, numbers, even though gang violence is not counted in ways that you or I would recognize. So um, that is, to me, that is that history of how the police presence created such a, um, a wealth of opportunity for gangs to proliferate. And it's still happening today. I'm a police department. I'm gonna reiterate this again. I'm, 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 and Julian said this, I'm not against the police. We, we have people getting murdered, getting raped, we know these nonprofits are not going to go pick up the child molester up the block. They're too busy with the bullhorn walking up and down the street protesting. We need the police, right, for certain things. We don't need the police working with rapists, active gang members. We don't need the police being sexist, racist, beating their wives, kicking the dog. We don't need the police doing any of the things other than protecting and serving the communities of which they are sworn and paid to protect. That's it, all the extra things that they're doing, getting involved with politics, attacking activists like me, making me homeless, ruining my life. Those things, that's not what we pay our police for. I didn't pay my taxes to be assaulted by my own police force. So folks, we got a little late start. We had a little weird interruption. It's a little over now. Um, so I wanna respect everybody's time. You know, uh, about 20 minutes past eight, um, Julian, I do have one question for you, simple logistics. For anybody that was hoping to get their book signed, how can we uh, connect with you 
on that? Well, I guess um, maybe I should, if Book Bar is still there or open to it, I could um, obviously like go there and 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 sign some books and or you sign them. Yes, <laughs> yeah. that's a yes, immediate yes. Give us your okay. address. Book How Bar. Okay, so we'll, for folks interested in getting your book signed, we'll convene at the book bar table. That's excellent. And um, are there any other questions from the audience? What, does Julia know when your documentary might air uh, publicly besides Kelly Wright? Uh, question, Julian. When will the documentary film, The Holly, air publicly other than in Kelly uh, I don't, um, let me see my mute. No, okay. Uh, I don't know <laughs> is the short answer. Um, I, uh, it's documentary is a strange business and the film will be shopped. And we, whenever we are fortunate to get a distributor, uh, we, I, I, of course, will try to make that known. It could be any time in the next, uh, I guess, year or something perhaps i just really don't know right now i wish i did terrence let's get a plank from your platform for mayor i mean so <clears throat> we'll focus on the main things i'm working on right now of course there's a thousand things from elected mayor of Denver i'm gonna have to focus on but housing uh, is my number one concern i do think we do we need more public housing in Denver. We're going to talk about affordable housing. I don't mean public housing like what we see in Watts. I don't mean public housing what we see in the Cabrini Greens or Robert Taylor Homes of Chicago. I'm talking about public housing like we see in Europe. That's clean, that's adequate. And, you know, what we're doing right now with, with our AMI, with affordable housing, it's, it's, not going to, it's not going to move the needle in the city, okay? Affordable for who? That's what we're saying in part of my campaign. And we need to focus on youth violence and family violence. We're coupling youth violence with family violence. There's this old narrative that um, Black and Latino kids are joining street gangs because their fathers are not in the home. That is not true. That is an old 1980s narrative. Black and brown fathers are in the home, but too often there's too much domestic violence or now we're dealing with second and third generation gang kids. But well, yeah, that is in the home, but that is a 48-year-old gang member. You know, so, you know, we, we're dealing with a youth and family violence issue, not just a gang violence issue with little kids. So housing is going to be literally what we're going to get the ground running on. And we're focusing on youth and family violence. In the metro area alone, if you count in all of our cities as one county, like they do in Los Angeles, we would average over 200 homicides in the metro area. That is ridiculous for a city like Denver. When we have the resources, our budget is $1.49 billion. We are wasting money. We wasted $366 million on a Great Hall development at the airport where they claim that the concrete was inadequate. So you mean to tell me contractors who can develop a $366 million airport development can't pick the right type of concrete? It's not making sense. Then we're going to cap the project in 2019. All of these things are Google. But now the city of Denver is asking for $1.3 billion to complete the Great Hall project at the airport. But it originally started off as $366 million. Make it, it doesn't make sense what we're doing in this city. We need no more three-term mayors in the city. Even if you don't vote for me for mayor, if they're not talking about democratizing our city government, meaning the, the city attorney should not be appointed by the mayor. If I am the mayor of Denver, why am I appointing my own city attorney that is making almost a quarter of a million dollars? And as soon as they investigate me, I have the power to call them and say, you're fired. It's not making sense. Why is the mayor appointing the city attorney, the fire chief, the, the sheriff, and the police chief? All of these are conflicts of interest. The mayor, we need to change the city charter to where the next mayor of Denver, even if you are a good mayor, we need no more three-term mayors. The mayor of Denver should only serve two terms, just like our governor, just like the president, okay? We've had Mr. Hancock in office 11 years now. He is less than a year out from being term limited, and he's literally just now doing housing initiatives. We still don't have one safe encampment. 
It's not making sense. That's why I'm running for office, because we need to change the way the city is run. This is not a small cow town anymore. And I know what I'm going to do in office. I don't know what these elected officials were about the, the cronies of Hancock or about the hop in this race. That goes for Leslie Harrod. I'll say her name because I'm ready for her. I'm ready for Alex Sanchez. I'm ready for any, any chronified elected official that wants to run for office. They're going to have to run against me. They're going to have to beat me. They're going to have to democratize the city or we'll protest them too. We protest black people too, just so you know. All right, so that's why I'm running for mayor because if I don't get in the office, whoever gets in the office, just so you guys know, it is hard to unseat the mayor of Denver because the mayor of Denver is so powerful. They are making so many appointments. I would be able to make over 200 appointments to either my cabinet, to, to different departments in the city, or on different boards. I will be starting off if I go for re-election already with 25,000 votes already in the bag because so many people are eating off of me. That's why when Michael Hancock ran for his second term, not even one person ran against him. Again, for his third term, several people ran against him and the, the runner up was Jamie Gillis and she lost by double digit points. Whoever is the next mayor of Denver, we're gonna have to see them for 12 more years and if it's, a, if it's Hancock in the Latino body, or Hancock in the LGBTQIA body, or another black Hancock, or another female Hancock, this city's in trouble. We can't afford another 12 years of this type of administration. And that's why I'm running for mayor, because we need action in this city right now. It needs to happen. Because those kids in that program that I was working with, they're still losing their lives. Those kids have been dead. We got a whole new generation getting wiped out. Those kids are two generations removed from, we lost a whole nother generation since that generation of kids, and we're in the process of losing another one this summer. That's why I'm running for mayor, because we need to change the city. My campaign is called the Save Our City campaign. It's not the elect him so he can be in the media campaign. I don't need any more media attention. We're here talking about a whole book about my life, good or bad. There's a whole documentary where I'm the protagonist. I'm running for mayor because I've already been slandered enough. There's nothing I'm ashamed of. Bring it on. But when I am elected, all the things that we're protesting for, we're going to do it, and we're going to do it fast. So that's what I'm running for. everybody. Really appreciate you coming out. 88.5 FM, 1390 AM, KGNU.org. Stay tuned. DJ Chris Nathan, the captain of the Eclipse Show, with some original music. Coming up, stick around, talk to your neighbors, hang out, have some food, have some drink. There we are. All right. Well, that's a show that I heard. It's a little difficult to have uh, one more poem to share for you. And I think it uh, goes in a good conjunction with the subject that's been brought up this entire evening. So, I work for another organization, another poetry organization, by the name of Arts and Ashes. And earlier this week, I did a poetry workshop at a juvenile facility called Gilliam, just over, kind of near Five Points. And it was quite emotional, because you know, you go in there and they buzz you in, and kind of what the poem talks about, but, uh, it's difficult to see people who look like me, you know, who are such a young age, because I'm an educator. I've been in education for over 10 years. And I've worked with many different populations, you know, Cherry Creek students to, you know, juvenile facility students. So it's difficult just to, and beautiful to be there at the same time, because I have worked with a lot of different kids, but their poetry was some of the most beautiful I've ever heard in my life. So I wanted to share this one that I wrote to regard to that. This one's called Gilead. As we pull up, we are greeted by a fire truck and an ambulance and the phrase, just another typical day here. A white sheep gurney and numb attendance, buzzer sounds. Chauncey shakes my hand, followed by a nasal swab up the nose. Negative, negative, negative. On the wall of the juvenile facility next to the four by eight cell, printed in, on the wall is the word democracy. Next to it is the word social change and social responsibility. 
Unfinished puzzles and stainless steel doors. Helium Youth Service Center. We give them the prompt, if you were a color, what would it be? I hear one say, I would be red, like a blood. Then if you were an animal, I would be a monkey. One of the officers chuckles and says, you would be with those big ears of yours. If you were a part of nature, one student says, I would be a hurricane destroying all of my path. One boy says he would be a dog so he could get all the bitches. Quickly, the instructor censors him and says, don't you need women. Even though a female dog is indeed a bitch. He stops writing for the remainder of the workshop. I am so moved by their poems and their laughter and their innocence. While some see criminals, I see children. Where some see minorities, I see myself. I tell them that they can get their poems published. Before that happens, they need to get their approval from their, their parole officer, parental permission, and the judge also needs to sign off on it to get their poems published. Goddamn, life's a bitch, and so is democracy.